on this episode, we're going to be talking about how our facial cues, how our body mechanics either attract people or repel them away from us, and how our a simple shift in our body mechanics can actually create influence. Welcome to Thriving Launch with Louise Congdon and Kamala Chambers, the show for heart-centered entrepreneurs who want it all. Five days a week, we bring you different segments to inspire you to live a life of freedom. We interview the leading experts in the field of business, health, and love. Be sure to check out Training Tuesdays, where we give you a clear action plan to grow your own business. Do you have a product or service that you would like to sell online? Or maybe you've been thinking about it, but you're reserved to do it because you need a website, you need complicated systems, and you need to spend money. Well, I've created a completely free course that teaches you how to use Facebook in a purely organic way. This means no ads and no money are needed. You can use Facebook completely free. So head on over to thrivinglaunch.com, opt into my profit from social media course. I'm gonna teach you the free methods to using Facebook to make money today. Today, we're here with Dr. Jack Schaefer. He's a retired FBI special agent, and he's currently working as a professor at Western Illinois University. He's the author of The Like Switch, an FBI agent's guide to influencing, attracting, and winning people over. And you may notice that we call him John on the episode, but he goes by Jack. John, it's so fantastic to have you here on Thriving Launch. I'm... I'm excited about this interview, and one of the the reasons I'm so excited is because you are an ex FBI agent, and you can use those skills, and you could teach us how to use those skills that you learned in the FBI to influence and to win people over. And this is just something that is so cool to me. Are you ready to launch into it? Yes, yes, I am. All right. Well. The first question I have for you is, I, I just want to hear a little bit about your background in the FBI that caused you to write your book, The Like Switch, and develop this body of work. Well, it, I began my FBI career uh, working criminal investigations at on the Indian Reservation. And out there, I had to talk to a lot of suspects to get them to confess to various crimes. And then from there, I went to language school. I learned uh, Korean. And then I was assigned to a counterintelligence unit, and basically a counterintelligence officer catches spies. And that's where I spent most of my career. The last seven years of my career, I spent as a behavioral analyst with the FBI. And it's different than the, the, you know, the BAU that you see, the behavioral analysis unit you usually see on TV. They have a crime scene, and they typically try to figure out who did the crime based on the artifacts left at, left at the crime scene. Our job in the behavioral analysis unit, we typically had a suspect or subject wanted them to do a certain thing or make a confession or interview them or get them to turn on their country and spy for us. And we would examine their personality and look for vulnerabilities and then develop strategies to uh, play to those vulnerabilities. So what are some of the first things that we need to understand in regards to attracting and connecting and and having the charisma that makes people like us? I think the first thing that that people have to realize is that we send nonverbal signals over long distances. For example, there are basically three like signals that we send off, and we don't realize we send those signals off, but they're actually nonverbal communications. For example, eyebrow flash. That is, the eyebrow flash is the quick up and down movement of the eyebrows, and it lasts about one sixty-fourth of a second. It's a long-range friend signal. So when two people approach one another, they eyebrow flash each other if they are, are not a threat to one another. So if we don't get a re- if we eyebrow flash somebody, we don't get an eyebrow flash in return. Then our brain picks up on that subconsciously and lets us know that you know something's a little off or something's odd with that person and they may pose a threat. So what generally happens is we approach people, one one of us will eyebrow flash and then the other person will return the eyebrow flash and that's just communicating back and forth, telling each other that we're not a threat. The second thing that we look for is the head tilt. And we ha- when we tilt our head slightly to the left or to the right, 
we're exposing our carotid artery. And that's an important artery that gives oxygenated, oxygenated blood to the brain and it's, and it's vital. And by tilting our head, we're exposing that vital artery and that lets people know that we don't pose a threat because if we're threatened, we try to protect that artery. So we head tilt and that lets other people know that it's a friend signal. The last one is the smile. And a smile is interesting because it lets us know that we're friends. It lets us know that we don't have any evil intent towards one another. And the other thing a smile does, and a lot of people don't realize this, is that when we smile, our brain releases endorphins. And those are the chemicals in the brain that makes make us feel good about ourselves. So the combination of those three things let other people know that we are not a threat and that we are open to communication with them. Oh, my God. I absolutely love what you're talking about. Are there other nonverbal cues uh, like hand gestures or the way that you hold your posture? I'm sure that there are a wealth of things, but anything that you want to share with us? It's an interesting story is that I grew up in the south side of Chicago, which is kind of a dangerous neighborhood. And when you're in a dangerous neighborhood, you don't want to send off friend signals because there's a lot of predators in those neighborhoods that want to take advantage of you. So what I would do as I, I grew up in the city is I would wear what I call the urban scowl. I wouldn't eyebrow flash. I wouldn't smile. I wouldn't head tilt. I would, would let people know that uh, I'm not going to be a, a very uh, soft target. But what's interesting is when I went out with my wife and she lived in the suburbs and when I went out to the suburbs, her friends kept saying to her, well, why do you like him? He seems like he's, he's so angry all the time and he'll bite my head off if I talk to him. And then she kept saying, no, he's a nice guy. But I realized I was taking that urban scowl out into the suburbs where they're not used to that. They're used to seeing friend signals. So they automatically interpreted that as me being mean and not liking people. So it's interesting how just with our nonverbals, we can send off signals that we don't even realize we're sending off. And the three signals that we mentioned before, people come back to me after reading the book or listening to my lectures. They, came, they come back and they say, we don't even realize that we eyebrow flash. And it's amazing. Once you know about the eyebrow flash, then you can spot it everywhere you go. Hundreds of times a day, you're eyebrow flashing people and people are eyebrow flashing you in return. To flashing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, I guess I guess it is a whole new meaning of flashing. <laughs> you know, it's a much more positive one. I absolutely agree with this. And I mean, of course, this has been analyzed, but I've found that it's been very helpful for me to change my body posture depending where I am in the world. As a female, I've been in a lot of situations and as a world traveler, I've been in a lot of situations where I've been in potential danger. And maybe it wouldn't be good to flash people. No, <laughs> no, it wouldn't have been good to flash anyone, eyebrow flash anyone. And I, I remember being in uh, Guatemala and my friend took off on me and I was out in the streets. There's nobody else around alone in a very dangerous area. And so what I did is I, I spread my legs really far apart. I jetted out my bottom jaw. I, I put my hair all like over my face and I swung my arms really violently <laughs> so I looked so I could look as ugly as I possibly could and as intimidating and almost you know I tried to look crazy too so people wouldn't mess with me and nobody messed with me instead of the normal guys driving by honking and whistling <laughs> so uh, you know I think that there's so many different ways we can apply what you're talking about. I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you use what you learned to win people over. Well, basically, when I go into situations, social situations, or even more importantly, when I want to exchange something at a store, something is broken, it doesn't fit right. And it's kind of a hassle when you have to go through the exchange counter and they're not always as friendly as they, I think they should be. But what you, what you want to do is you want to, as soon as you walk up to that counter, you want to eyebrow flash, you want to head tilt and smile. And that lets that person know, wow, this person is not going to be a threat. And if you make an empathic statement and that increases the likelihood they're going to like you, and an empathic statement is very simple. What you want to do is look at that person, see what their, their physical status is, 
and think about what they've said and look at their emotional status and just mirror it back to them. Carl Rogers came up with the, the empathic statement construct, and it's very simple. So you, and that keeps the focus on the other person. So I'd walk up to the counter, I'd eyebrow flash, head tilt, smile, and say, so you look like you're pretty busy today. And what that does is it keeps the focus on the other person. It lets the other person know that you're actually interested in them and the, and you've actually taken the time to look at them and, and you know, analyze what they're doing. And if they're happy, I always say, you look pretty happy today. And they always come back, yeah, I am pretty happy. And they'll tell a little story about why they're happy. And then once you get that person to like you, which only takes seconds, then you can introduce, well, I've come here to exchange this product. And they're more receptive at that point to, to help you resolve whatever problems you have. Well, I kind of want to hear what the trick is. Like I watch Luis do this all the time. He's so good at winning people over in customer service. And then uh, how do we do this with just our voices? Because Luis will call the phone company and he'll spend 15 minutes on the phone and they'll, you know, if there's been a mistake with our phone bill, they they take the $100 off and they don't argue with him. I call the phone company and <laughs> after an hour and a half, the representative will hang up on me and then I get nowhere. And then, you know, versus the 15 minutes of Luis, like turning on the charm. So Luis, like you do that. How can we do that with just our voices? I was just saying tone of voice is, is extremely important. If you walk up with every word dripping with sarcasm or cynicism, the words in and of themselves are, may not be harmful, but the sarcasm dripping off every word or the cynicism dripping off every word causes a, a bad impression. So you have to be careful about your tone of voice. So once you've kind of connected with the person, which is a, a fairly quick happening because people are we're, we're noticing so many things at such a fast rate and most of that is nonverbal cues from putting your hand out uh, the slight tilt of the head which i didn't know people were doing or the eye flash the eyebrow flashing so those are two things that i'll be looking for within myself and other people once you've kind of inter, you know you've you've introduced yourself how do you maintain that sense of uh connection or attraction i know you have a, a tr uh, some chapters on building the friendship maintaining the connection what are some things that you recommend are you talking about a long-term relationship or a short-term relationship well let's start uh, with short, once yeah. once uh, once yeah. uh, uh one, a one event encounter well, let's start with both a uh, short term and then go into long term. Well, one of the ways that, that I typically continue that relationship is I'll do the three friend signals. I'll make an empathic statement and then I'll flatter the person. And if you compliment or flatter a person directly, sometimes it can be misconstrued. Sometimes it doesn't come out right. It sounds patronizing. So an alternative way to compliment somebody is allow them to flatter themselves. People rarely miss an opportunity to psychologically pat themselves on the back. All I do is provide that opportunity. For example, we're at the complaint desk. I don't know how you can, how you manage every day dealing with people that are always angry because the products aren't working and you have to try to appease them and, and make them happy customers. And the person behind the counter is thinking to themselves, well, that's exactly what I do. And thank you very much. And they give themselves a silent psychological pat on the back, which brings us to the, the golden rule of friendship. And that is, if you want people to like you, you make them feel good about themselves. So by complimenting some, somebody, what you're actually doing is making them feel good about themselves. And then they're going to like you. And that's going to build on the other things that you set up uh, through the empathic statement and the friend signals. I, I'm just wondering, sometimes when I go into big department stores, I feel overwhelmed. I feel kind of bombarded by all the smells and the lights and the noise and the people. And I'm just, I just happen to be a highly sensitive person. And uh, so sometimes that puts me in a state of like being on guard, like protecting, like bubbling up a little bit. Um, what would you say about that? Well, then you're going to be issuing uh, foe signals, which are opposite of friend signals. So then people are going to look at you because if you feel threatened in even a minor way, your body's going to respond by looking menacing. And other people are going to pick that up because it's a subtle nonverbal pickup. And they're going to see that and they're going to say there's something about that person that I don't like. 
or I feel that's possibly threatening. And what they're going to do is respond in like by being not friendly themselves. This happens a lot. In uh, I teach at Western Illinois University, and the students always ask me about job interviews. I said, there's a one thing you should not forget about going into a job interview, and that is your nonverbal behaviors. When you're going into a job interview, typically that's a threatening situation. So, so unconsciously, you're going to walk into that job interview feeling threatened. And if you feel threatened, you're going to project those nonverbal foe signals. Your employer is going to see those nonverbal foe signals. And subconsciously, he's going to say, there's something wrong with this person. I can't put my finger on it. I don't know what it is, but I'm not so sure I like that person. So what you have to consciously do when you walk into a job interview or you walk into a store and you want to uh, portray yourself as friendly, even though you're not, you want to make sure that you eyebrow flash, head tilt and smile. And that requires you to practice these things a bit. And a lot of times uh, people will come up and say, I caught myself eyebrow flashing the other the other day. And now I know what it feels like. So now once I know what it feels like, now I can emulate that in a situation where I, I may feel threatened, but I want to portray, portray a friendly uh, image. So this is why everybody thinks I'm a bitch and everybody loves Luis in, in department stores. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I would say it's, <laughs> yeah, I would say it's nothing other than you're you probably are wearing a, an, an urban scowl and people are picking up on that. And Luis is probably walking in and issuing eyebrow flashes and head tilts and smiles and um, hey, how do I buy this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do I buy this? That's always a good start to get people to, you know, once once you're on a friendly basis with them, they may even give you deals. Yeah, that does you know? happen too. In fact, what happens is if you like somebody, you're going to do whatever you can to help that person out just because you like them. They're not going to ask you for anything. You know, you're just going to do it willingly. And I think that's the irony that people don't realize. If you want someone to help you out, be nice to them and they're going to help you willingly. Because they want to, not because they have to. You know, Kamala asked a question earlier, and, and it, it really relates now that uh, we're here at this point here, uh, Dr. John. One of the things that uh, Kamala asked is, how do I get on? Uh, I in our, in our business and as a couple, one of my uh, jobs that Kamala has given me is anytime we have to call any 1-800 numbers, you, you know who's going to be making those phone calls. And when I do that, uh, any time a live representative gets on the call with me, I imagine that this person is my friend. I imagine that this person wants to help me. Uh, and I imagine that, uh, you know, they're hard at work. They've been dealing with a lot of uh, nasty people throughout the day. So my interest is to make this call a pleasant experience for them. Uh, and so I focus less on the problem and focus more on can I make them laugh somehow or ask them a question that most people aren't going to be asking. Uh, so instead of trying to get it done and over with, I'm more like, hey, I'm really glad that uh, you're here to help me. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad that we're on this call because I've been having some problems. And I know you get calls like this all the time. You save, uh, you've saved us <clears throat> thousands of dollars with these calls. Yeah. Really. Yeah. I have gotten all sorts of discounts, but uh, I think that if I communicate to them that I am their friend or at least think of them as my friend, they're just uh, one of many people in a huge organization. So my job is to try to make them smile during that call. That's all I actually really care about. Well, that, you know what you're doing subconsciously? You're doing everything that I write about in the, in the like switch, but you're lucky because you're, you're, you can instinctively do it. There's many, many, many people who don't have that same instinct. So by learning all the techniques that you're doing, giving that variable a name, then they can actually intentionally go into those situations and do what you do subconsciously. And that's what's important is that we can get a lot of people who, who aren't naturally uh, ingratiating to become that way. Yeah, that's very true. You know, I'm curious, uh, in your work and doing doing this work with the FBI, were there times that it was very important for you to turn on this like switch when you were working with someone that uh, it really, you know, maybe had committed a crime or was a suspect where you needed to turn this switch on and, and some of the things that you would do is it, this is I'm guessing that uh, this stuff was very important when you're dealing with an adversarial uh, person. 
it's extremely important because if I I remember several times I'm talking to to murderers and if they confess they're going to go to jail for a very long time perhaps even the rest of their lives and I learned very early on that people will not tell you their secrets unless they like you if they like you your chances of getting a confession significantly increase. So my goal at the beginning of the interview is to use those friend signals, develop good rapport. And then once good rapport has been developed, then they're more likely to confess because they like you, not because they're forced to, but because they like you. So one of the questions that we asked earlier, and I appreciate that answer because I think it's uh, very true in all areas of life. Uh, I think that uh, most people, uh, all people from what I've seen, if they like somebody, they want to do stuff for you and they want to be connected to you. And uh, it's actually not only good as a self kind of motivating self interest kind of thing, but it's also really good just because I personally enjoy having people like me and I enjoy liking other people. So I have an intention of let me bring out the best in you and offer the best of me as well. And and I find that that creates a nice kind of reciprocity circle. One of the questions that I asked earlier is what about long-term relationships? Because all this stuff right now, uh, calling somebody when I call somebody for a, uh, you know, with the phone bill or some kind of bill or some kind of transaction or some kind of mistake has happened and I need to call one of these numbers, it's all very short stuff. Or when I walk in and I, I want a cold pitch or make a sale or deal with customer service people when I'm walking into some office, it's short. What about some of the longer term tips that you have in order to stay in the good graces or have a healthy and maintain a a great relationship with someone more long-term? Well, one of the things you can do to monitor long-term relationships is something we developed called the friendship formula. All friendships are based on four elements. The first element is proximity. People have to be in physical or virtual proximity in order to develop a relationship. If you don't know each other exists, there's a zero chance of a relationship developing. The second thing, you have to be frequently with that person. If you're frequently with that person, then they appreciate you more and they like you more. And the third one is duration. So you have to spend time with the person. And the more time you spend with somebody, the more you're able to influence them and the more they're able to influence you. And the last element is intensity. And that those are can be measured in the nonverbals, like mutual eye gaze, touching, whispering, food sharing, you know, all of all the things we talk about, eyebrow flashes. And if you constantly let each other know that there's intensity in that relationship, then the relationship is going to thrive. Now, in bad relationships, I can easily detect where something went wrong and how to fix it. First thing I ask is, do you spend a lot of, are you, you share the same space? Yes. Are you, do you frequently share the same space? Yes. Is there duration to that space or that frequency or that the time you spend together? Yes. Now we get to the intensity. And this, this, I ran across this in one of my, uh, my uh, experiences as, as a psychologist. And that was, the answer was yes. But then when I got to the intensity portion, the young child said, yeah, my dad's there all the time, frequently, but he only talks to me during a commercial when he's yelling at me to get him a beer. And so what I can do there is say, aha, we have the three elements, but what must we do? So I would instruct the father. You're going to have to spend more time, you know, more intensity. You're going to have to provide your child with more intensity to let them know that there's a, a relationship there. So if you want to build a relationship, you know, introduce more intensity to the relationship by talking to them more, complimenting more, you know, being with that person more, more empathic statements. So it's it's a way to where you can monitor relationships and it's a way you can even develop relationships because a lot of students at, at the college at Western Illinois University, they say, well, I don't know how to get a girlfriend or a boyfriend. And I said, well, the first thing you, you need is proximity. You have to be where they're at. And the second thing you need is you have to be there frequently because the more time we spend with somebody, the more we like each other. Even if we don't talk to one another, we like them more. And that's the psychological principle of familiarity. And then you spend duration with them, time with them, and then there's intensity. So you can actually develop a relationship using the friendship formula. 
That's really cool. One of the things that uh, I have a friend who is an incredible networker and he has a a huge contact list on his cell phone and email list. And one of the things that he does quite frequently, and it's something that I learned from him, is he goes through his phone and starts looking at all the people that uh, he hasn't talked to in a while and will just message them and say, hey, I haven't talked in a while. Just curious how you're doing. And he, uh, you know, I used to kind of tease him a little bit about that. Like, man, you really have to reach out to these people to, you know, be friends with them. Shouldn't your friends be people that are always reaching out to you? And his response was, well, you know, if you want to have a lot of friends like I do, and you want to be connected to a huge amount of people, you consistently need to at least once a week kind of check in and see who you haven't talked to in a while and message them and check in with them. And that kind of keeps things going. And he's using the psychological or the friendship formula for that to, to develop those friendships. And I, I know some salesmen have called me or emailed me and said, you've increased my sales. And I said, well, how's that? And they said, well, every week now I stop in to see my client and I don't ask for a sale. I just say, how are you doing? How's the family? What's going on? And then he leaves and then he comes back. And then when he feels the relationship is strong enough, then he'll start asking, do you need anything? I'm, I'm selling this. And he said that even new clients and existing clients order more, you know, goods and services from him because he's he's developing a relationship with them through frequency and duration and intensity. So it works in business, it works in friendships, it works in law enforcement, it works in all 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 areas of life. And you know, one of the, the keen things is is if every time somebody meets me and I make them feel good about them, they're going to want to come back and see me again. I won't have to invite them back. They'll do whatever they can or make up whatever excuse they can to come back and see me again because they want that same good feeling again. So if you want a lot of friends, you have to focus on them, focus on the other people. And then because of the focuses on the other people, they like you, then they they, they will be drawn to you instinctively because they want that same good feeling again. I absolutely love everything you're sharing today. It's it's like one of my favorite interviews of all time, honestly. Uh, I'd love to hear any last thoughts that you have to share with the Thriving Launchers. Well, the, the, I guess the basic thing is if you put the other person first, make the whole relationship about the other person, then they're going to like you. And when they like you, they're going to develop a good relationship with you. They're going to help you do things. They're going to want you to succeed in life because they feel wanted. They feel needed. And isn't that kind of what life's about? It goes back to that the rule. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. So actually what we're doing is putting other people first. And by doing that, we're actually liking people. We're developing relationships. And we're going to get along a lot better because – I think a lot of times our ego gets in the way because we think the world revolves around us. And when finally somebody else puts the other person first, it's such a refreshing uh, experience for the other person that they're going to want to experience that again. So and you can use it by using the simple techniques that we even talked about today. Those three friend signals, empathic statements, allow people to flatter themselves. That's the way you can make friends and develop friends. Thriving Launchers, we've been here with Dr. John Schaefer, a former ex-FBI agent and author. We've been talking about influence, attraction, and being willing and being able to draw people into us. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone, and keep thriving. You've been listening to the Thriving Launch Podcast. For books and resources related to today's episode, make sure to head over to thrivinglaunch.com. We'll see you there. Hey, you guys, make sure to check out the next episode, especially if you have any pain in your body, because we're going to be talking to the author of The Pain Deception and How to Eliminate Pain. 